Chris, man, super uh, grateful and excited to have you here today. You, uh, we were just right before we hit recording, we're kind of j- just laughing and talking about it. he's he's on book number five, man, and that that takes some work and some doing and and got his hands in all kinds of stuff. But but before we jump into any and all of that, give us give us your background, brother, and and tell us where you started, how you got into it, and and how yeah. it led to where you are today. I started out in uh, Westchester County, New York, about thirty five miles north of New York City, in a beautiful town called Pleasantville. Believe it or not. Uh, Two great parents, two older brothers, had a great childhood, sort of idyllic, uh, I would say. And uh, then I I went to law school. Uh, I went to Purdue University for a year and a half. I went to Brandeis in Northeast. Then I went to law school in Vermont, got a master's degree and a law degree, shot a low budget film in New York City, loaded up the car, drove to LA, spent 11 years there trying to be a screenwriter, got a manager and an agent. Got a baby at the end of it, which was really the the Peter Pan moment came to an end. And uh, that was the beginning of uh, life once I saw that little guy's eyes. And uh, my wife and I ended up moving up near her family in Northern California. And believe it or not, the best option was a funeral home. Uh, She had a friend in the business, a mortician who had always said solid business, good stuff. Jumped in it with him. He left after a year and a half and I was there. Um, and learned a ton. I mean, uh, in many ways, I say that that was the greatest part of, uh, of my journey so far, because it just told me to, you know, what's really important in life. Right. And I oh, think that's exactly I right. Here, that's, right? that's that yeah. it, it, it alters your perspective. I, I like to refer to it as kind of like the, the deathbed perspective, or when you're <laughs> dealing with the, the fragility of life or the, the fact that life ends all of a sudden you see things differently. You do. Right. And you were right with that day in and day out for years. Yeah, And I was it with it in, like you said, day in and day out. I was sort of the uh, behind the scenes guy. I thought I was going to be this behind the scenes guy. And in a small funeral home, you have to wear many hats and yeah. started getting deeper and deeper into it. And I think, you know, as I met with families, um, that was really what became apparent. Um, I was hearing the same messaging from the surviving loved ones. You know, they knew that I had a, a one-year-old at home and another one on the way. And they were like, you know, get out, bro. You know, get out while you can. Take, smell the coffee. Go to the, be their coach and everything. Go to every school play because they were telling me, they said, look, you know, he worked 40 years of his life, retired and died. What What's the point, right? So I, after hearing that so many times, again, I had left the screenwriting world and I was like, I don't need to go back, man. It was rough. It was a rough existence in Los Angeles. And then after about seven years, I was like, wait a minute, I'm hearing the same things. And I said, this would be great for everyone to hear. Right. And, and again, they're nothing too revelatory that you're like, Whoa, that is it's commonsensical stuff that we all need that when we step off that habit trail of life, trying to like, you know, I need to earn this. I need to live here. I need to have that. You know, that's what the greatest gift for me was because I was that guy. Right. And I was like, Oh my God, how am I, how am I going to send my kids to private school? How am I going to send my, you know, all those things. And you're like, come on, bro. What's really important in life. Yes. That small moment with your son or daughter. And it, it takes so little Greg, you know, we, we over blow everything. They care about when you're on the carpet with them, looking them in the eyes, playing figurines and in their world, right? That's a good stuff. That's the good stuff. And so I always say the the funeral home has, or funeral homes have been my greatest gift. I mean, they taught me smack you upside the head and, you know, slow down, bro. It's not that big deal. Right. And you're, what a, you're right. What a gift, what a privilege, What, what a blessing to be right there in in what i would call sacred moments like those are sacred moments life and death right and you're right there with those families and hearing those messages and and how how special of them to say hey man no guarantees make make sure you're doing what matters and that it's not it doesn't have to be the big grandiose stuff like right. I, I i like the grandiose stuff right i i tell you my kids i'm like where's the farthest reach of the world like let's go do the most epic crap right but then right. you're right it's like sitting out back one day just laying on the trampoline with the kiddos looking at the stars or something man that just hit home 
And it's yeah. so prof- profound and so powerful to, to connect. Yeah. And I say, you know, my favorite times are tuck in times, right? Because that's sort of the yeah. end of the day and everyone kind of lets their guard down. Everyone had a shower and their bath time and they're just, and for me, my kids are a little older now, but when they were little, this is that that's when they just started ripping, you know, telling you about their day, telling you about their fears, their hopes, their excitement, their joy, and the ability to just lay there and look at the ceiling and listen that that I I found so many pearls in those moments. And, you know, I would hope that you and I can teach the younger men coming up that's that's our messaging right you know we're all look at we're all go-getters and we're all we're all trying to you know win the game so to speak right but i'm i'm here to tell you those times in laying laying tucking your boys or girls in that's going to be your golden moments those are the ones you'll remember ever forever yeah priceless now see i i I have a, a a unique advantage uh because we have seven children I have kids that have already moved out and I still have little girls that I read to every night. Right. So <laughs> I'm, I'm still in the mix. Oh, what of great it. perspective though. Right. Yeah, I, I mean, love it. Yeah. And then probably the older ones love hanging with the little yep. ones. And that, that's a, that's yep. another unique perspective. You need to write. Yeah, <laughs> that's I am. I am. I'm writing. I'm writing. Both my Good. wife and I are both writing actually Good. currently actively writing right now, Good. Good. Uh, but you're right. And I just want to emphasize that what was really cool is so we adopted our oldest. She's 20 now. And right from the get-go, I'm like, we're, we're reading, man. Well, we're, we're big book lovers. And in fact, my wife and I, our whole relationship was built on reading. We started our first date and, and our first date was talking about books we were reading and, and it just started a whole marriage. And so we read and, and every night I read to my little kids right now, the older ones there, they, I don't read to them anymore, but I, I've been reading for 20 years and, and that evening time routine, that's, that's holy. holy. And to, to have those, just those little moments. And it, it, man, it just breaks my heart because I hear often dads will have a struggle, especially with toddlers. Well, both toddlers and teens don't want to go to bed for some reason. <laughs> they don't want to go to bed. And so it can be a battleground. But I'm like, no, man, don't, don't let that time be a source of contention. Let it be yeah. a source of connection. Right. And that is a special place right there. Right. And, you know, look, the teens, is, man. I, so I have three boys, one's just heading off to college, one's a junior and one's uh, in seventh grade. Yeah, good. And that, that, you know, 14, 15, 16 for boys, at least in my, I don't know girls, but my world, that's tough years because they're trying to figure it out. The hormones are changing. Dad is way less cool than he used to be, you know, and uh, it's, they're trying times, uh, especially, you know, in, in these days, Greg, they're, we're all here, right? On it's the like, device, man. You know, on the phone, yeah. laying on the couch, not maybe contributing as, you, as much as you want to the family dynamic. Yeah. Um, but you're right. Uh, we have those peaks and valleys. And I talk about that in the book, right? We all think life is like this, right? That perfect graph chart and rises to the sky. But the reality is, this is the chart of life, right? Up and and down, weather, all over. Got to weather the storms, whether it's with our children or our wives. You know, I've been married 21 years, and it, you know, it's it's not. My wife will be the first to tell you it's not. <laughs> it's not that trajectory upwards. We have peaks and valleys, and uh, I think you know from those valleys is where the good stuff, where you really start to understand and build on relationships. Right? It's easy when things are going good, whether it's with your children your business or with your relationships uh, to stay up, right? That's good. Mm -hmm. But what happens in those valleys, right? And that's the good stuff for me. It's like, whoa, you see shit goes sideways, right? Shit goes sideways every day. If you're a small business owner, every day it goes sideways. (laughs) How do you react to that? (laughs) That's the key, right? And I'll tell you, I have friends or, you know, even relatives who, are flustered with, you know, one child and, you know, a a nine to five job. And it's not for everyone. And that's why I think, you know, your program is really interesting, especially with entrepreneurs, right? You got shit coming at you from a hundred different ways. And it's, it really teaches you in those times, especially turmoil, um, you find out who the teammates you want are, right? Or who that, who that is, who the good stuff is, who who are the good people in your life and how are we going to get through it together? Because no one really gets through this alone. I, I'll be honest right. with you. Right. You know? And, and well, man, let's, do, let's dive into that a little bit more. 
and and you find out what you're made of, right? I, yeah. I, I'd love to think about, especially lately, I've been thinking about this. It's one thing, you know, to be the man when things are going well and everything's great and it's smooth. Like, and I hope that happens a lot. And I, in fact, for most of us, I hope that's the majority of your life. Things are going well and, and you're reading it. But but what happens when they're not? When you're down in those valleys, when you're in, in those dips, when when times are tough, I love to to ask this question. Think about it, like. What kind of leader are you going to be? What right. kind of reputation are you going to establish? What what are you going to choose to be made of in those moments? And and not just throw in the towel or excuse away your crazy behavior because it was hard, but like how how are you going to roll? Yeah, and it's not even really even a, a leader in my world. It's like it's it's you as a person, right? Because mental illness and mental health is sweeping this nation, right? And you know. I think the greatest message that we can share is it ain't always easy. Yep. And when you're in that trough of life, the greatest thing about it, and I, it wasn't me who said it, it was some famous poet about laying in the gutter. And the best thing is that you could look up, you're looking up and you're looking at the stars, right? The stars from the gutter. And, yep. and that's, that is so true. It's such a great life lesson because um, I think a lot of us, feel like we're in that trough trough of life or in the bottom but that you know it's it's who you are that's who the good stuff is and i mean with any business leader you talk to any they're like the journey was way better than the result right Amen. and you Absolutely. don't realize it you don't realize it because it's so damn hard sometimes when you're in it and yeah like, right when you're in it and you're like oh how am i gonna get out of this and money troubles and relationship troubles and and you know inventory troubles or whatever it may be um but i tell you man it's that's the cool stuff because that's the stuff they don't teach you in business school because exactly. you got to think on your feet and you got to pivot right and that's that's from wherein the success is is great and it's it's really you said it i think you said it best it's it's from within you yeah. right it's it's in that do you have that fight that resiliency exactly and, uh, I love that stuff. Oh man. So let's, let's circle back to some of, I think you've had a unique perspective, uh, especially being so close to death and to the, the loved ones who are experiencing it. Yeah. And even just, I'm looking here at your, the list of your, your, your 20 lessons, right? And I'm just like, <laughs> we, we could do a whole podcast on each one of these because they're right. just so good. <laughs> But give us give us some of the the ones maybe stories examples big lessons that stand out to you that are so relevant to where most of us are at right now. Uh, maybe it's business or work, money issues like you talked about, family struggles, kids making their own decision, strain on the marriage, maybe on the health, uh, worries about the economy and the future of the world. Like, what are the big lessons and takeaways you you were able to glean from from those years of of, of that proximity to? to death and, and those who are experiencing it on this side. I, I think the greatest overarching one for me is, was the perspective of um, in those intimate moments, in those times of going to someone's home who was on hospice. Um, the most interesting thing that I found was who is there, right? And uh, God, I'll get choked up even just talking about it because in life, uh, we're always trying to succeed and impress and gather more friends or, you know, especially when you're young, you think that's important. But uh, I guess what the lesson I love is that on your deathbed, you know, who are you going to be surrounded by? Right? Who is going to be sitting there holding your hand? And those are the faces that you want to proliferate memories with. And so, you know, for me, I'm, I've always been a family guy. I don't know what it is. I've just always, I had a great once in a generation relationship with my grandfather who lost his wife early. And I think he was instrumental. And I've, I've had really great parents knock on wood. They're 83 and still healthy and really have taught me everything and I think that has been such a prevailing thought in my mind is family, family, family. And then going into the funeral home and seeing what I saw, uh, it was always family. 
and when it was always family. And then one of the great moments, again, from the book, is the Mel Gibson story, which everyone really loves because it's kind of salacious and, and a celebration. Uh, uh, I interviewed to be his uh, assistant, his number one assistant. It was a time in Hollywood when I needed that job, bro. I, I, I needed, I was, I was hungry. So I did all my homework, right? He was about to make uh, the Vietnam film. I think it was Once We Were Warriors. And it was written by uh, Randall uh, Wallace, who wrote Braveheart. Wow. So they stuck, they stayed together. But I took the script and I deconstructed it because I thought it would be brilliant to come into my meeting with just me and Mel in the beautiful Paramount lot in this beautiful setting back and deconstruct it for him. And I did. And he just sat there sitting across from me, one, only us two, no one else around, outside. And I deconstructed it and told him what was wrong with the script. And he said, oh, okay. And I went back uh, to my other job on the lot. And uh, the next day, the, the head of the studio uh, <laughs> called me in and said, what the fuck did you do? You, did, you told Mel Gibson that Oscar winning uh, screenwriter, his <laughs> script was shit. And, and I was like, well, now that you say it like that, it probably yeah. wasn't the hardest thing. <laughs> and I, I guess that's so why I said to her, I said, I guess I didn't get the job. And she goes, get the fuck out. Oh, <laughs> man. So I went back to my little cubby. I was doing like the Academy Awards uh, seasonal stuff. And of course, felt about as, as big as this. Yeah. Knew I didn't get the job, knew I needed it, was wondering if I was going to get fired. You know, someone's going to come with my right. box today. And out of the corner, some random guy from the studio comes running over, dips his head into my office and goes, did you really tell Mel Gibson his script was shit? And I looked at him and I go, I did. And he goes, you're a freaking rock star. And he ran out. <laughs> <laughs> so wow. again a failure moment yeah that was pivotal in my career i did not get the job yeah but it taught you know it taught me a couple of things taught me to, i uh, taught me to go with my gut my gut was wrong in that situation but i think i was a man of principle and, and even just that kid telling me you know that i'm a rock star uh, i just felt empowered i don't know why and um you know that, I thought that was a, just a great story. And everyone who reads the book is like, that story is great. great. No one can believe it's real. Right. And it's, it, well, and it's a, yeah, it's, it's those failure moments. It's taking the risk moments and man, those are impactful. Uh, are. You know, just even listening to you, I'm thinking of the stories, epic failures and big mistakes, right. That were pivotal for me that you, you do yeah. something, you make a mistake, you make a choice, you just go all in and you're like, yeah, I, that was wrong in so many no, but, ways. Right? I mean, you never and, forget. And it's important for us to share those stories because that is, that is everyone has them. Um, they're epic. And that feeling that you have right, right afterwards is so bad that yeah. you, 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 you start thinking, how am I going to survive life yep. after this? Yep. And you do. You do. You put one foot in front of the other, like the old Christmas story, and you keep walking out the door. And that's that's resiliency. That's like you talked about what's inside of you. Yeah. That's the good stuff. Um, but again, remaining true to who you are, I felt it was the right decision. I was, uh, you know, clearly over 18 and I was making the decision. And it was a bad one, but it was my own. Yeah. I mean, well, you're right. It, it, and, and thank you for bringing that up. It's that it's the feeling after we fail mm. that we have to process, learn from, deal with, get up from. Right. Because you're right. You feel like such a schmuck. And right. And if you don't have someone to share with, yeah. you know, if you don't have a trusted friend or, you know, a girlfriend or a wife or, you know, a counselor or a mentor to share with, I could imagine it's even you know, 10 times worse, right? Yep. Because half of the half of the the good part of that is going out for a drink and saying, you're not going to what I, I just did, did you know, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> just to get the words out, right? Yep. It, it feels better. Yep. Uh, so yeah, I want, we got to share with people and tell them, you know, find a mentor, find a friend, 
and talk about it. Talk about your failures because yeah. uh, it's not as bad as everyone thinks. No, and and well, it's critical. There's there's a lot of people talking about the importance of failure and learning to fail forward, and that failure is fertilizer. But it, it, I like you know, that. it's just, yeah. we, we're afraid of it. I I, I wonder how how much in life we have missed out on because of the fear of failing or what's come up interesting is as all the men i've worked with the fear of failing and the fear of looking like a failure well that's that seems huge. to have a huge impact that's a huge impact because i i think um our lives especially our lives in suburbia is all about keeping up with the joneses yeah. right and i'm 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 the first one to say the joneses don't exist or if they do exist, they're the probably the most twisted family in suburbia. So don't try to keep up with the Joneses, you know, don't try to drive a special car. Don't try to look a certain way. It's not, it's not cool. You know, it's funny. High school is such a great melting pot. And when, you know, I, I happened to be the captain of my football team and looking back, the most interesting people were the people I thought were freaks. And those are the people that are going to change the world. Um, those are the, going to be the Steve Jobs or the Wozniaks of the world. The, the people that are a little bit different uh, uh, and who stay true to themselves in their difference are, are the most interesting people to me. Um, and they're the free thinkers of the world. And uh, gosh, I wish I could go back and say, I'm sorry to whoever, you know, might have wronged. I, I was never mean to anyone. I know that. But um, those people, I'm looking back and I'm saying, man, those are the, the people that were progressive at the time. Yeah, the ones, they didn't realize that, right? Right, right, right. <laughs> but they're willing to be uh, in, unconventional, to be nonconformist. Yeah. yeah. Right? And that, that great quote by Rollo May is like, the, the opposite of courage isn't cowardice, it's conformity. Ah. <laughs> and so there's, there's some deep fear there that causes us to conform where if we'll say, you know what, no, I'm going to. I'm going to sing my own song. I'm going to sing the song I was born to sing. I'm going to do the thing that really matters. And of course, there's going to be some failures. You're going to fall on your face. But yeah. if you keep getting back up, you keep learning from your mistakes. I mean, it's, don't just keep repeating your crap, right? Obviously. Yeah. <laughs> if I, you learn I, from I, it, I, get up. Wow. Right. And the unconventional life is the more interesting, more fun life. I got to be honest with you. And I think, you know, you alluded to, wow, Chris, you're writing books and you're writing, you're a funeral home guy and you have internet sites. And, but that I, when I, I made a very early decision and I, I would say early when I started in business, I've owned 17 years now I've owned funeral homes. And very early on in that, I was like, I see what, I see what's happening every day. And I see the happenstance of life, right? People are dying for no reason sometimes, whether it's a motorcycle accident or just, you know, uh, uh, an embolism in the head or whatever it is. I said, I ain't going out like that. I, I said, I said to myself, I ain't going out like that. I said, I'm going out the way I want to go out. I'm going to have fun. And my children are going to know how much I, their dad loves them. Yeah. And that's, that's a pledge I made to myself. I would say probably three years in and nice. uh, having, I had, you know, two or three year old and an, another infant and uh, probably another one on the way at the time. And I think it's really important for us. Our messaging should be, don't go out like that. Yeah. Don't, don't, don't conform. Right. Especially your audience, right. They know they're not conforming already. The entrepreneurs of the world are the, are the free thinkers are, what can I do? How do I, how do I fill a need? How can I fill a need and make it better yeah. or make it better? That's, that's how we should look at society. We should have our head on a swivel all the time trying to find where's a problem. How can I fix it? How could I do it for an affordable price? Make some money, exactly. but not kill people to make money. Right. right. It's that you, there's a balance. It's hard, man. It's a hard thing. It's a hard thing. And but we have to yeah, declare this, this sovereignty and, and be willing to do life on, on our terms. Yeah. I love that. It's so, great well, and I think this is, that's a good lead into let's, let's hit a few more things you learned about what really matters. Because mm -hmm. when, you, when you get into that space you've been describing, those experiences, all the other stuff melts away. Mm -hmm. And, and what I heard you say just recently is like, it, again, family, again, letting your kids know how much you love them and cherish them and, and proving it, not, not just saying it, but proving it with, with time and attention time. and focus, um, but also like getting, getting rid of the distractions and the fluff and the crap and getting down to deep meaning and, and purpose. 
And I'd, I'd love to hear some more. Like what, what else did you find that, that kind of melted away? What do you, you see that really mattered to people? I think what, what mattered to people, you know, I saw what mattered to people a little bit too, too late, I think. I think there was a lot of regret in the families that I um, tended to meet with. Um, they, they wished for something greater for the loved one. Um, and they wish that they, um, had learned something earlier on or wish they had intervened in that life earlier on, you know, the, you sit and you can listen to <laughs> eulogies ad nauseum and, uh, in sitting and listening Again, from my perspective, you could imagine that after a while, you're like, okay. And I almost felt at, at times sitting in the audience, and I would sit in the back and not always listen to everything, obviously, but sit there. You wanted to just stop and say, did you freaking tell them when they were alive? Yes. Right? Right. So all of this you know, stuff you're saying All now. this stuff, right? Yeah. And you make it sound like a great person and you make it sound... But did you tell him, right? And so like, that's kind of a, a big message for me is like, tell them now. And it's so hard because we're all living our lives and we're, we're all busy. You know, we're a busy society. We're a busy world. But have you told the people um, how much they meant to you? Yeah. And, um, you know, my parents were really good about that. I remember coming home from college and going to a little league coach's house and just on my own during Christmas break or uh, at, during the summer break and, and just knocking on his door and saying, I just wanted to thank you for what you did. And he would be like, you know, they felt a little awkward and they're like, yeah. what are you talking about? And I'm like, I know that you came from work, you changed in the car and you gave me an hour and a half of your time to teach me baseball. And that means the world to me. And I think for the most part, I think I did it on two, two separate men. And I think they didn't know what the hell to say. Yeah. And one was sick. I know that. And I, and his, his son then told me, you know, who happened to be my friend. He told me years later, he's like, I can't tell you how much that day meant to my yeah. father. Yeah. So we're here for a short, short time, Greg, you know that. And I think it's important to te tell those people in your life, whether it's a family member, a friend, a mentor, or just someone who ran through your life for a very short time, but was pivotal, right? We have those people, a teacher, my, my, I, have, I can clearly see teachers who had an interest in me, even though I wasn't that most interesting kid. Same, you know, but connected with me and believed in me in that small moment of an hour and a half, two times a week. Yeah. And it meant the world to me. Yeah. And I think, you know, we need to thank those people. Absolutely. And I try to do that. You know, that's, that's important. Man, just hearing you say this is, well, honor, honor and kudos to you for, for making the effort to go do that. Same yeah. thing. I'm sitting here thinking of the people that were pivotal in my life and they probably didn't realize it. And I was, I was out of my own at 16. I don't know if you know my story. And, and I was just, man, I was just, just trying to survive. I was in survival mode oh, wow. and looking back, these people that just went out of their way to put an arm around the shoulder and say, Hey, you got this, you can do this. That meant so much to me. Right. And at the time I was like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> right. But right. later on, I'm like, Whoa, I right. can do this. I can do this. Cause so-and-so believes in me. Right. And then I had a chance, same as you, there was this gentleman, he went out of his way when I was out on my own. He, he and his wife, man, they, they would, anything I attempted, they were there to support me <laughs> and they were huge. And I, I thanked him then. But then after I got married, after I was into my career, after things were just going so well, I, I told my wife, I'm like, we got to stop and say thanks. <laughs> and we did. And it was, oh man, it was so yeah. special. It, it feels so good. Special. Yeah, it feels it feels good to you, and I know it feels good to them. Yeah. Uh, no appreciation, uh, gratitude, empathy. Those are some of those the underrated wor <laughs> words in our world. Um, but man, they mean the world to people. 
They do. Yeah, they really do. I know they do. So it's worth, man, it's worth all of us, uh, those of you listening and you and I, Chris, to do this even more, like more deliberately, more intentionally, sit down, think about the people currently in our lives or in the past, like who do I need to reach out to? Who do I need to express love to? Who do I need to feel more love and gratitude for, right? Kind of open up the heart first wow, and that's then express a, it, right? That's a huge thing. Yeah, because it's not, yeah. So I'm in Northern California. We have a horrible homeless problem and I need to learn more and um, be more gracious, I think. And it, it's a problem and it is a blight on our community, but you know, it's trying to find that empathy and uh, man, we need more empathy in the world. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I talk about it a lot in, in reverence for the elderly of our world. I'm not a hundred percent proud of the way Americans treat, I, you know, assisted living communities. I, I understand the need for them, but I, I just think the European or the Japanese model of revering the elderly and keeping them in the home is something yeah. that we could all learn from. Yep. And I think, you know, for me, I say it because when I was a teenager and young 20s, my grandfather was so much in our lives. And again, my he didn't live with us, but he lived close to us. And um, that I believe young people and old people mixing, and it gave me such an appreciation for the elderly and reverence for his story. My, my, I, he's an immigrant, like all of us, or many of us are. Um, and uh, having that sort of empathy of where he came from, he came from Germany on a boat and traded for money by his father. I mean, crazy stuff. Wow. And delivering milk and eggs and pickles up and down the streets in New York City in an unair conditioned truck. And so I tried to share that story with my children and say, hey, man, when you think you got it bad, yeah, <laughs> look at you look at from the seeds you came from, and you say, "I got this. Yeah. This ain't so bad," you know. And I think that kind of reverence for the elderly. Again, I know you you said it, it the being gracious to like a, uh, the homeless or or finding gratitude or it's tough. It's not always easy. Right. Um, but it's necessary. Yeah, oh, couldn't I couldn't agree more. Yeah, what what's interesting about that is, last year my my little brother took his life. Yeah. Um, and and at one point he was, he was so into drugs and he was living as a homeless person under some overpass in California. That was my little brother. My little brother was one of those guys that we drive past and and we're, we're afraid of and disdain, and. And I've been thinking about him during this whole conversation. Um, how, you know, you're always thinking, what more could I have done? How could I have loved more, reached out right. more, how more? Was there something I could have done? Um, my, the one thing I always go back to in my mind is I just randomly sent him a message on, on Facebook, said, hey, I love you, brother. I just want you to know I love you. Mm. And you know how it shows you it was delivered and then it was seen. It mm. says seen. And then it was a few days later, I found out that he'd taken his life. Yeah. And, and, and you know, there, there's always more, but you're right. We've, we've got to think, think about who, who we can love and who we can reach out to and how we connect. And, and I love the extended family. We, as a family, we've traveled extensively, even lived in, in Latin America as well. They very much have an extended family connection that's very yeah. admirable, right? We, we've gotten so nuclear family here. It's just mom, dad, and kids. And yet, you know, I, I love what you're saying. In fact, as we've traveled around the world, I've seen that in almost every other place. You're exactly connected right. Connected extended family and they're intentional about it. Very intentional. And we need to be more intentional as a nation. Yeah. I, I truly do because I, I don't get it. I don't get from where it comes from. And, uh, you know, we, yeah, I just, I don't fully understand the whole dynamic and, it is such a great learning tool and everyone learns and everyone benefits. I just, um, again, yeah, it, it, I, I ain't going out like that. And I told yes. my parents, I said, <laughs> I said, it ain't happening for you. And, you know, my mom called me 83 years old and called me six months ago and told me about visiting a friend in New York City. 
and she was in a home and you know just laying in a bed and she's like don't you ever and I said mom you will never be there don't worry not by hook or by crook if we're you know we got nothing but two sticks to rub together it ain't happening yeah and so yeah I mean I guess you said it we got to be more intentional and I think we have to just live with a hell of a lot more empathy empathy yes the ability to put yourself in that person's position yeah. and again you know passing people in the street just assume they're they're having the worst day of their life yeah. and and say hey you doing yeah you okay i got you if you, you need help you know and uh it's hard yes. it's not always easy yes not always easy yeah man man i, I just i love I love this conversation. I love what you're saying. And, and, and this whole idea of I ain't going out like that yeah. has so many implications of how we treat others, how we love and connect with them as they're leaving this world and how we build relationships and live so that when it's our time to leave, it's a totally different story. It's a short time. I'm telling you, you know, you're not in control of that short time and think, you know, you're middle-aged dude, how much more you got? Right. Say that to yourself. No guarantees. You don't know. It ain't no guarantees. You're right. So go out like you want to go out. Do the job you want to do. Create the art you want to do. Write the book you want to do. You know, go travel the way you want to do. But but how, Chris? How? Okay, let's let's roll with that specifically. Like, okay, you let's say somebody's listening to this and they're like, yeah, man, I've always wanted to to do this thing, or I, I hate my job. I abhor this work I do. I don't want to change careers or, or things are off. I got to repair this. And I, I think getting into the, uh, getting into the, the, the details and the grind of, of change. How do, how do we go about that, man? What have, what have you it, seen it, and experienced yourself? It happens one step at a time. And it is it first, it happens in the mind. You have to, you have to commit to something. You don't make a rash decision. You don't quit a job. You start being intentional with all of your thoughts. Uh, again, I'm a, I'm a little bit of hoo-ha guy. I love the secret. Uh, I believe in manifesting your own destiny. I believe in thinking positive. Again, I, I don't care where you stand on the religious spectrum or what. It worked for me. Yeah, me too. Uh, I believe in it. I bought it hook, line, and sinker. Used to listen to the tapes all the time yep. in my head. Me too. Repeatedly. I was doing it yesterday. I was listening to Wayne Dyer yesterday. Oh, Wishes fulfilled. Same thing. My kids so like I fell asleep, and that. I'm like, this is amazing. Yeah, yeah. Because you have to be intentional. And again, it's not knee jerk, right? Most entrepreneurs are not like, bam, I'm going to jump into that and I'm going to crush it. No, it's intentional. You have to make a plan. If you have no money, you have to make a business plan. You have to present it. You have to show 10 friends. You have to hear all this, sh shoot it down. Be intentional, make a plan and start, right? That's the, the biggest thing is taking that first step. And you look at behind you is all these books. There's every book under the sun that could help you teach self-help books, how-to books, novels, all these things will help. Yeah. And then you can start to make your own map, but it's got, you got to take that first step and yeah. you got to make plans. Sometimes plans are a month. Sometimes plans are two years. Sometimes plans take a generation. Yep. It's, it's what you make of it. But if you got it in your soul that I hate this job, I want to be a painter my whole life, you'll make it happen. Yep. You will. You will manifest it. You know, it's that old Jim Carrey. I wrote myself a $20 million check. Well, he did it. He, he was using The Secret or Wayne Dyer or, you know, any Ogmandino or whomever. Right. Any of these great people, you know, the world's greatest salesman, right? It all starts with something. And find that kernel in a book, in life, a mentor, and go with it. Mentors are huge. They're huge. People in your life. Got to have mentors like, and coaches. And they want to help. Yep. And usually the good ones want to help for no money. Yeah. You know, they want to just help. I want to share. It's like you and me right now, right? We're sharing the way I was as a young man, man. I, I didn't know shit from Shinola. Yep. and same uh, you know <laughs> i was like maybe, maybe less maybe less yeah yeah and i had amazing parents you know and you know i 
my father started a business out of our in our dining room and I saw people moonlighting come into our house and my mother fed them every night and I was 15 years old when he started his business and I'll tell you I learned more in those high, my high school years watching people come to our house and my father building a business than Wharton could have taught me in how many ever years yes. of business school. Yes. It was the greatest business school I ever took. And I thank my father all the time. And it's funny, you know, my father was an executive, built a business to 45 people, you know, successful by any way, shape or form. And now in retirement, the last 10 years, you know, he looks at me and he, you know, we reflect and he says, you know, Chris, no one comes to me for the answers anymore. Interesting. And his self-worth after retirement definitely waned because he felt like he wasn't the man. And right. so part of my, not my job, but part of me being a son was constantly calling him and asking keep him. Keep going hey, back. Right? Yes. Hey, help me out. I, I don't know what the hell to do here. I got a, I got a problem with a family. I, I got problems. I got to think about this mortgage. Can you, can I bounce this off of you? Yeah. And, you know, my dad obviously was my greatest mentor and I was very, it's very nice to have your own father be your best friend and mentor that it's a, that's a unique thing, but it kept him in the game too, you know? And I, I know to this day, he, he now, you know, once he turns 80, he gets a little more vulnerable and a little bit more, you know, lovey dovey and, you know, he's a German immigrant, you know, grunt, work, 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 work. And, and now, you know, it's very interesting. He shares with me how important those times were. And it makes you feel good. It makes That's me feel good because beautiful. I know how, how much I've learned from him, you know? Yes. Yeah. Oh, it's huge, man. Great Again, stuff. big takeaways here for, for me and for all of us, like turn, turn, turn to those, those men, listen to them, listen to the wisdom and the stage of life they're in, turn to your dads and man, most especially be, be that kind of dad, gentlemen. Yeah. Be the dad that's the, the mentor, or wife, the, coach, the role model. Or woman. Yeah. I mean, I, they, mine just happened to be men, but man, right. there's some amazing. My wife's happened to be one of them. Yep. <laughs> Same. There my are wife amazing as well. women uh, leaders in this world and Absolutely. business women. And yeah. But yeah, I got you loud and clear. But if you could be that dad, you could be that light to someone else. Woo. So this, the, what's, what's standing out to me from, from some of the things you said recently is like, and I wrote, I wrote this as I was, uh, I've been writing on my book every day. And one of the things I wrote the other day is like, you know, you're, you're a few books away, a few conversations away, right? You, you talk to a few pivotal people, you read a few pivotal books. You literally could be a few books away from being a much better version of yourself, of overcoming a weakness, of maximizing a possibility of just, you, you, you get so close sometimes I can't even imagine how many people have gotten so close to their dream and then backed off yeah. so close to overcoming the obstacle, the challenge, the difficulty, the, the addiction, and then pulled back. And they're like, no, yeah. you were right there, man. Yeah. You were right there. Yeah. And who knows, yeah. but a conversation or a book. It, or, or exactly a conversation. And it's just a push. It's that last push, you know, uh, you know, Man, I, I think we've all felt it in business. We've all felt it in relationships. And it is it is that grind and it is that fight that is the good stuff. And it is so hard to see, especially for young people, um, especially for people who grew up in privilege. It seems so easy. It's not easy. No, no one ever, ever had an easy time mm -hmm. to make something good. And it's hard, but doing the work, it, it, it is, it's what feels good. It's what makes it all worthwhile. And you look back and you laugh and you smile and you regale stories of, oh man, I know being part of a team that was, you know, football team or whatever it is man, you remember we got smacked around that one time and we were the, we thought we couldn't win a game and then you win. It's, it's, it's the practice. No one likes to practice. No one likes to run lines, you know, in basketball, but that's what in the fourth quarter, you're going to be making the layups or your shots going to go in and not hit front rim when your legs are tired. 
It's the little yeah, stuff, right? right? Yeah. It's the little stuff in life, bro. You know it. I know you know it. it was, we'll change the world by that. We it's, will. It's, it's beautiful and relevant. I was sitting last night. My daughter wanted to try out for a, a soccer team, a, a comp soccer team here. And, um, and she was last night and after practice, after. So we went over early. I went with her and we were just drilling and drilling and drilling and drilling pretty hard for 30 minutes in the, in the Georgia heat and humidity, right? Sun. And we, she was spent when practice started and right. she played a long, hard practice at the very end of practice. It was over. And the coach is having them run sprints racing. And I'm like, yeah, girl, like go. And, and go she would it. go all in and she'd look over at me, right? Soon yeah. as she crossed that line, she'd look at me. She's looking. I'm like, yeah, I'm like, go, oh, you got this. And it would lit her up and she'd turn around. She's going to go again, right? I yeah. was right there as yeah. she's running those lines and, and sprinting and racing and competing. I'm like, yeah, this, yeah. Is where, this is where we develop what we're going to be made of. That's where champions are built, man. Anyone yeah. will tell you that, you know. Uh, Michael Jordan wasn't a favorite. <laughs> he wasn't like too much, but he could grind. And so, so yeah. could Kobe, man. They could yeah. go. Yeah, they could. Yeah. And yeah. we got to find this this spot where i don't know i love all of this man where we can be be whole men um, yeah able to to feel and love and and cry and inspire and, and appropriately correct and, and discipline when needed and and lead out and and really get down to what matters in life uh more than anything else yeah, I think it, you know, it's, it was a generational thing. I think, you know, our, our fathers, our grandfathers came from that immigrant mentality and it was work, 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 you know, pound, pound, pound. And, you know, you make something, you stay with a, a job for 40 years and, you know, you do that thing. And, and that's just not this generation anymore. No. I think, I think more than anything, 9-11 changed the, the, the collective conscious in our, in our country. And I think, many, many men said, what the, f you know, F, I mean, I, I ain't going out like that. Yeah. I ain't going out like that. And it, look, maybe that's the biggest takeaway, you know, do you and do what feels good. And family always feels good to me. Yeah. That, that's just the way I live, yeah. what I like. And uh, same, you know, it's, it's a good way to live. It's a good way to live because I'm going to tell you <laughs> when it's your time, that's who's going to be there, you know? That's who's going to be there sitting there. And, you know, the ability to hold someone's hand when they're dying or near death. Priceless. Unbelievable. Yeah. Had it from my grandfather. It's the greatest, greatest gift I could have ever given myself or given him. I know it. I know how much he loved me and I know it brought him comfort. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, it'll change you. Death will change you. Yes, it will. Yes, it will. I've, uh, I've had, so I, I love, I love emergency medicine and I've told some of these stories in our, in our other podcasts. Um, last year we were, we were hiking in Ecuador uh, up, up on a mountain and, and, and I had a chance to go help somebody who'd fallen mm. and she was a, a young Ecuadorian woman in, in her twenties uh, and she died in my arms right there on the mountain. It's 16,000 feet above sea level and in austere conditions. And her boyfriend had also fallen and we were able to rescue him. But, but, but that's one of those moments. And it, it hit me, it hit me hard. Every time, every time it hits me hard, right. That, uh, that they'd made some, they'd unfortunately made some poor decisions that led to that fall. And, but when, when, a when a life ends literally in your hands, you think differently <laughs> about what you're doing. And why you're doing it and what matters and, and and i you know i hope i think there's going to be challenging times coming i think uh globally as a we're kind of in a the winter of of an economy and a society and there's some tough times coming and so for all of us i mean your, your message couldn't be more relevant or more timely because right. we're going to be put to the test right there's there's going to be stress and strain and struggle and and people are going to be tempted to to snap or crack right. or, or bust or whatever like when you put a little pressure on now what like it's right. easy to be nice and kind and loving and all this good stuff when things are going great. But what about when it gets really hard and the pressure's on, right. we, we've got to cultivate some of these things. So I think your message is, is pivotal in so many ways. Yeah. and so important to be spread right now. I think you're right. I think, uh, 
you know, again, demystifying sort of the male mystique from yesteryear and, and being more vulnerable. It's not always easy, of course, um, but good things come from that vulnerability, I, I find. And uh, again, what what are we trying to be, you know, this idea of man? Um, I think it's it's more cool, uh, you know, bringing it all down and and trying to get on the level with uh, our children or our friends and just being more real. I think that's that's the good stuff. I really do. And, you know, I, the other thing is sharing with your children that I'm making this up, bro. I, I never been a parent before. <laughs> I'm just making it up as I go. <laughs> I, I tell that to my sons all the time. I said, Hey man, don't, you know, I'm this trying is my to first time. Too. Cause I tell my right. kids too. Hey man, it's my first time being a parent. I, I'm trying to figure it out, bro. <laughs> and, and I, I had a, a couple of times I had my sons look at me like, Hey bro, I was, <laughs> I thought you're the dad here. I'm like, yeah, but you know, seriously, those are great moments. Cause they're like, Oh shit, I guess we're, uh, I guess we're in this together. So yeah, exactly. <laughs> figure this out. And uh, yeah. man, the, the, the the first that your first child man i always i was like ah we, we made a lot of mistakes when you were yeah. little man we just yeah. didn't know we just didn't know yes. any better sorry yeah yeah sorry exactly. the younger ones are like you're getting a way better version of me right 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 that is so uh, true and probably a way easier version right you yeah know, i know my brother said that oh you're the baby you had it so easy and and i did i you know if, if, if I'm being honest with myself, I did have it easy and my yeah. parents were, you know, they, they had other things to do. They were starting a business. So I had a good, a uh, lot of freedom, as they say. So oh, it, was, it was fun. Yeah. <laughs> life, life is such an incredible journey. And, yeah. and like you've emphasized so well, it's just this short time in between birth and death to, to really make something of ourselves. Um, I, I'm going to read, I'm just going to read through this, your list here of the 20 things just real quick, but then, and then invite you to just share one last thing, one last thing for, for the, the good men listening to this one last, uh, lesson or, or thought or piece of advice, whatever you want to share, but I'm going to, I'm going to read through this real quick, just cause right. I want to, I want to tease them into this, your, your 20 <laughs> things here. So one is be thankful Two, make a difference. Three, avoid judgment. I'll just keep going. Respect others and yourself. Be vulnerable get uncomfortable. I love that one. Failure is the foundation. Love simply. Become a familiar. I loved that one, man. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm, I'm interviewing a, a friend of mine. Um, he wrote a book called Life and Air. Same, same principle, like yeah. make sure you, you're really wealthy in life. Be a life and air, the familiar. I love that. Yeah. Make a few good friends. Be with self, laugh, enjoy food, sweat, fiber, and water. Stop worrying about money, have faith or spirituality, embrace the elderly, exercise your mind, be resilient. And then your acronym DEST, right? <laughs> love, love it. I was just, just looking over that, like, yeah, there's so <laughs> much goodness. And, and this is just one of, of your, your five books, but any, yeah. any last thought? We've hit some really great stuff, brother. And I really appreciate you sharing your life lessons and actually want to, you know, share a little honor to you to put in the effort to share what you've learned because you could just keep it and be like, you know, I'm going to do my thing, but, but you're writing and there's a lot of work in writing and putting your message out there. So thank you for, for valuing yeah. others enough to share what you've learned, but any, any last, any last thoughts you want to share? Yeah. I mean, I think it's that, that last one, right. Desk, you know, the desk stands for do epic stuff today, or, you know, change that S to whatever you want, but uh, it's important. You know, uh, there's a famous, uh, uh, poem in the funeral industry called the dash right and we have uh we have a starting point our birth and our death right but but the dash the in between stuff is what you make it yeah and that's the good stuff that's the living right and uh, make your dash the best you can be um we're we're all here for a short time do you do what feels good i mean don't be a hedonist obviously but uh <laughs> you know kind of do what your joy is find your joy um, again, simple. I don't think I'm, uh, I don't think I'm the first guy to ever say it, maybe just said it a little differently, but, uh, yeah, do you and, and go out the way you want to go out, write your own yeah. story. You said right. it, sing your own song. I love that. Let's do it. And, and, and be alive. Somebody, somebody one time, uh, 
you know, stopped us and it was like, man, talking to my wife and I, and it was like, man, you guys, you guys sure have figured out how to squeeze the juice out of life. Right. And I'm like, yeah, that's yeah. it. Like, that's, that's what I'm doing. It. I want to, I want to be alive while I'm alive. Right. Cause right. I've been there, you know, when I, when I was out on my own, I was homeless and yeah. no family, no friends, very little food. Didn't know yeah. where I was going to stay sometimes, man, life sucked. It was right. so horrible. Right. And, and, and having been in those lonely, dark, depressed, discouraged places, thought, man, when I get out of this, I'm, I'm going to live Yeah. and, and I'm going to make it count. And, and then, you know, the experiences you've had and that I've had just yeah. reminds me like, you know, if, if you got a day, if you woke up this morning, whoa, what a privilege. Huge. Huge, Huge victory. We right. should wake up every morning, no matter what we're facing, and be like, yeah, I get another day. Right. I get to be alive today. I get to love on somebody. I get to be yeah. loved by somebody. I get to make a difference. I get to live. And man, that's your message is spot on, brother. Let's do things that are, are, are succi- exciting and fulfilling and meaningful and things that matter. Right. Yeah. And try to try to not listen so much to the society telling you this or that. Yeah. I mean, the ears are the greatest thing to listen to absorb or books. Yeah. But, you know, there's always going to be a, an uncle at the Thanksgiving dinner says, you can't do that. Or yeah. a friend. That, <laughs> I mean, I had a, a slew of them. And, you know, even as a young man, I just look him in the eye and I'll be like, I got this, bro. I'm going to show yep. you. Yeah, and I, you know, you never, I didn't ever be disrespectful, but right. do you? And yep. let don't let anyone quell your dream. Never, never let that happen. Exactly. Never. Man, I love it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank I really you. enjoyed talking to you, Greg. Thank you. Hey, where where can they find you? Connect with you? Yeah, I'm. Where's uh, the best spot? We have a chrismeyerauthor.com is my author website. You can see me on Amazon. I got a little author thing there with my books. Um, I hope everyone goes to funandmoving.com and and gives it to a person in need who is stuck in life and needs a little exercise or rehab. We have a really exciting platform, very, very affordable at $10 a month. So um, we're trying to bring goodness into the world. And uh, I think we might have done it this time. So I'm yeah. really excited about that. That's fantastic, man. Yeah. You got all kinds of good things going on, brother. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for thanks for being you. Thanks for sharing your message. And thanks for giving us your time and and you're of really yourself today, it. man. Thank yeah. you for the opportunity, Greg. It was really nice talking to you. Yeah.